Cool. Well, thanks guys so much for being on this call. I'm really excited to share with you some tips and tricks to telling a really nice photo story. And you guys are able to see that now, correct? Yes. Cool. All right. So let's get started. So for the discussion today, um, we're going to go th quickly through why photography, what is a photo story. I'm going to give you an example of what a photo story would look like. And then we'll get into some tips for putting together your story, tips for general photography to make your story stand out. And then we'll go into a quick question session about that first part of the presentation, and then we'll get into some submission details, assistance, and your questions answered and all that kind of stuff. But before we do that, I just want to quickly introduce myself. My name is Justin Grubb. I'm the director and co-founder of Running Wild Media. Um, we're basically a production company that's focused on wildlife and conservation storytelling. And so that storytelling can take different forms, whether it's film, whether it's educational outreach, whether it's photo exhibitions, photo stories, articles. We really use visual media to help tell a story to essentially change behavior in an area that we want to do it. So our media that we create is part of the conservation initiative that we're trying to do. I'm also a photographer, a wildlife filmmaker, cinematographer, director, but my background is in wildlife biology. So I was a biologist for a number of years and then a teacher and then kind of used my interest in photography and took my two career interests, combined everything. And now um, I'm here with this production company that specializes in conservation storytelling. So the first question I wanna answer in this presentation is why photography? Um, and I, beside the obvious, a picture is worth a thousand words. I'm sure you guys have heard that several times and it truly is like you sh you see a picture and you kind of get a full story within that picture without needing someone to really describe it so it's a very easy method of communication that sort of can um, reach different languages different areas around the world and really capture attention so a good photo really evokes emotion can really be used to share ideas um, and a really good presented photo can change behavior um, if that's what you're trying to do and create empathy with the subject and the characters in that photo. So the photo I chose to share with this um, is a photo of US Fish and Wildlife with a red wolf in Florida. So you can kind of see how they're all leaning down and they're at the level of the wolf. The wolf is in this on a scale with a muzzle on its face and they're kind of touching it, comforting the animal. There's a lot of emotion and things that are conveyed with this image that I think are pretty powerful. And so when you just see that image, you kind of get a grasp of what's going on versus if I were to sit here with no image as a reference and try to explain to you exactly what was going on. So photography is a very, very good way of sharing ideas quickly. And today's day and age, with the fact that we have the internet, things can be shared so easily, a picture can go viral. If you think about, you know, that one, the seahorse that's grasping the Q-tip, you know, that's kind of the poster photo for like reducing ocean plastic. Um, so really a single photo can spark an entire movement. And so that's why, you know, photography could be such a powerful tool, easily shared and can communicate with any language around the world. So how does that relate to a photo story? Um, you know, a photo story is pretty much exactly the same as every story that you've ever heard you know it's just told through a series of photographs rather than you know a song or a film or a storybook um, so it really kind of like shrinks down the information that you're receiving to a set of images that convey the same story that you're used to seeing so the story's got characters it's got place it's got a guide it's got conflict and it's got resolution so when you're looking at a photo story, you want to have all of those things in there, but it's just told within a series of photos. Um, and so it's just really that simple. Um, it's a narrative through imagery. And so here's an example that I want to show of a photo story that I put together about the Red Wolf. And I'll explain kind of how it all fits together. And so as you're moving from the left of the screen here to the right, you're kind of getting a full timeline or a full story that's being laid out in front of you. So 
you know, in the very first image you have here, you've got your character. That's the one that is changing throughout the story. So the things happen to the character, the character adapts, the character goes through changes, just like a very similar story that you would see on, you know, a Disney movie or something. The character, character goes through some sort of change to make it to the end of the story, the resolution of the story. So this is the character of the first one. And it doesn't have to be an animal. It could be a person. It could be a situation, uh, depending on what your projects are about. But in this example, I've chosen an animal. So the next images, they give you a sense of place, but they also give you a sense of the conflict. And so, you know, the place that these animals live is really a patchwork of agricultural fields and plots of forest. So you can really get a sense of how fragmented these animals are in the wild as well as the roads that cut through their habitat. It says Red Wolf Cross in here. Um, so that gives you the place, and but it also gives you the challenge that these animals are experiencing in the wild. So that's kind of the next step, character, your challenge. And then in the next photo, you know, the Red Wolf as a character meets their guide, which is gonna help them through the rest of the story. So in this case, their guide are the scientists, are the researchers. So these three images are kind of you know, this is a young red wolf that is getting vaccinated. And then the next step is the red wolf is going through a soft acclimation in Florida, and then it's being loaded onto an airplane. And then it's moving over to a soft acclimation pen in North Carolina, where the, the wolf is being paired with a wild wolf, released, and then now it exists in the wild. So the challenge, the guides that are gonna help move the character through the story to the climax or the resolution. And now there's wolves that exist in the wild because of the story. Now in this photo story, and is also gonna be true with the photo submissions, there are captions that go with each of the photos. And that helps kind of bridge the gaps between the different photo, uh, photos in the story. Captions aren't always required for a photo story, but sometimes they can be very helpful. And so for our photo story competition, we are going to have captions that could be included in the photo so you can explain a little bit more about the place, the location, the characters, the guides, the resolution, if you feel necessary. And so this is kind of like a complete story of what you would typically see for a photo story. Now note the number of images that are in it. It's not an overwhelming amount of in images. It's also, you know, a perfect number of images that can describe the scenes. So you're really taking a snapshot of a scene. You're choosing one photo to represent that scene and you're plugging it into your photo story. And that's kind of how a photo story is laid out. So this is generally how you would want to read a photo story as well from left to right. Um, in a timeline of the story, how it unfolds. So an example format that we came up with, now this is just an example. You don't have to stick with this whatsoever. In fact, that's the whole point of art, right? Is challenging the social norms or the standards. So maybe a submission that we'll get will be completely different than anything that anyone's ever put together for a photo story, but it might change the whole um, photo story understanding on its head, which is great. But this is just an example. If you're struggling getting started, this is just something that you can use to help guide you through creating your photo story. So the first photo would be of your main subject. It doesn't have to be an animal. It could be an environment. It could be a person. It could be a community. It could be a group of people. It could literally be whatever your goal is or whatever your thing is that you are going to try and change through the use of the conservation standards, the things that's going to go through growth. And so the next image, you want to do the scale of the story, you know, if it's a landscape, or if it's a habitat, or if it's a population, or the number of people involved, you could do that in one or two photos. Generally, if you need more, you can also do that. Like I said, there's no like real rules to this. This is just sort of a guideline. Um, so the next one, you're going to do like the conservation challenge or the threat or the thing that you're trying to um, address. In my photo story, I combine scale and threat together into one image. You are more than welcome to do that if you want. You could do different story elements into one image or you can place them into separate images. This is your 
story. So you can do whatever you feel like is the best for your conveying your story. Um, the next series of images, I would recommend showing the planning since that's an important part of the conservation standards. Um, you could do that through one image, two image, showing people working together, showing um, some task that is gearing up for the resolution doesn't necessarily have to be planning, but that's just kind of um, something that we thought would be useful in sharing your story. And then the next one would be implementation of that action. So what the planning has led up to, it's the implementation of the thing. So in my photo story, the implementation of the action is the wolf running out of the enclosure for the first time. It's kind of hard to see because it's on a small screen, but this image depicts a wolf running out of the soft pen that these two wolves are in there. And so that's like the implementation, that's the thing. And then the result could be one or two images as well. In my photo story, the result is the wolf in the wild and the, the paw prints of a wild wolf in the ground. And that can be accomplished with one or two images as well. And so that would really demonstrate a good full circle of using the conservation standards as well as telling the story that you guys are set to, to set to tell. So some things that make a good photo story are being selective. So I know it's tempting to use a lot of images to tell a photo story, kind of like a film, you know, film has a lot of different scenes. And a photo story is challenging because you have to take those scenes and pull one image out of it and then put it next to another one. And that's really what's going to move you across your photo story. So the best way to really do that is, you know, to, if you have a lot of images, say you have 100 images, you want to sit down, look at your images and break that down to 50 images and then give yourself a break, you know, a lunch break or an hour or two or something, and then break that down to 25 images. And then wait a day or two, come back, look at your photo story, and then take those 25 images and try to make that eight to 10 images or five if you think you can do that. So giving yourself that mental break in between choosing photos gives you the opportunity to look at it with a fresh set of eyes, so that you know you could be a little bit more selective, a little bit more critical when looking at stuff because you're no longer looking at this massive data set of images, you're only looking at a small data set and then you could be more critical while looking through those images to determine which one um, you want to use. Another uh, thing that you can do is share multiple story elements in one photo. So if you have you know, 12 photos that you wanna do, but we're cutting off at 10, uh, but you do have a photo that could potentially satisfy multiple story elements, definitely use that. Like I mentioned, I used the scale and the threat in the same image because it shows you all of the separated agricultural plots and how fragmented their habitat really is. And so you could totally do that to help shorten your photo story or to make your images more interesting. One big thing is to evoke emotion. You want the audience to feel something. I'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about photography, but one really good way to evoke emotion is to get eye level um, and to use certain colors in your images. So getting eye level of the animal or the subject or the habitat close up, that's a really good way to evoke emotion. Another good technique is to figure out your story first, then create the imagery. So it's tempting to look at all your images and see how you could pull them all together to create a story but really think about what you want to tell first. So write it down on a piece of paper. You can even use like a timeline, you know, start, end, and then write in, you know, where your climax is, where your resolution is going to be, your implementation, all of that kind of stuff, and figure out what part of your conservation project is going to fit those story elements the best, and then go looking for the images that fit that. You are more than welcome to use images that you already have in the past uh, and bring them forward to make up this photo story. But if you're seeing some gaps in your photo, your photo story, then you can go and take new photos and go out and try to get as much as you can to fill that in using the techniques that you'll learn about in this presentation. Um, but that's something that'll be really helpful because if you have the story 
and all the elements of the story, finding the photos and then placing them is gonna be a lot easier. And then in between the individual scenes, use a variety of shots and perspectives. That's gonna make it visually more appealing for people when they look at your story. And it's gonna help them understand a little bit better because they're gonna be interested. So if you're using close-ups, wides, telephotos, aerials, all that kind of stuff in between different elements of your story, it's just gonna make it a lot more interesting and visually pleasing so that you can really get pulled through that story because you're really wanting to know what's the next image, what's coming up next, because your mind is gonna be um, on edge. You know, it's, it's not gonna necessarily be able to predict what's gonna be coming next. And so that's what's gonna bring you through. You're gonna wanna see what's coming next and that's gonna get you all the way to the end of that story. So things to be aware of when you're putting together your photo stories is not to use too many photos. It's tempting. When you have a giant wall or a giant screen full of photos, it can be really intimidating for someone to look at all that. So really try to tell your story in 10 photos or less. That's the challenge for this one is to try to tell your story in about 10 photos or less. Another thing that will be helpful is to focus your story. So it's tempting to tell a story about all of the conservation projects that are going on, all of the ways that the conservation standards are helpful in the programs that you're doing, but really finding one shining example that you can use and tell one focused story is going to be a lot clearer to an audience or someone who's looking at the photo story than trying to show as much as you possibly can, because it's going to be difficult, it's going to be convoluted, it's going to be <laughs> a lot to look at. So that is another thing to be aware of. And then also know the story elements. Like I mentioned, your character, your guide, your conflict, your resolution, your sense of place. Those are all typical photo or typical story elements that you want to include in your photo story. And there's tons of references online you can go to. If you just Google like what is a story, you can find all of these different things. And all of the guides are going to have different elements that they think they rank that are most important for a story. And then you're gonna click on the next link and it's gonna have a completely different list of things that are important in a story. But generally, you know, you want a character, a place, a guide that's gonna move that character through the conflict and into the resolution. So for an example, I'm gonna use Star Wars. Your character is Luke Skywalker. Your guide is Yoda. Yoda helps Luke move through the conflict of figuring out that, and hopefully this isn't a spoiler for anybody, that Darth Vader is Luke's dad. So he's got to do that conflict. And then the resolution is, you know, he converts his dad back to the light side. And so that's a pretty good story arc there that is an, another example of what you could use in your, your photo story. So tips for taking great photos. Um, one of the best things that you can do in a photo is to show a perspective or an angle that's not usually seen. So we walk around the world on two feet and we generally see it between five to six feet. And that's just kind of how humans are looking at the world. So everyone's used to seeing the world from a certain angle. But if you deviate from that, and you show people angles and perspectives that they don't normally get to see, then that's what's gonna make something interesting for them because that's not what people are used to seeing. So things like eye level with an animal, above an animal that people don't typically get above, like a bird. You know, People are used to seeing birds from the ground looking up, but if you can show a bird from above, it's a completely new angle, completely different, and that'll catch somebody's eye. Getting wide, wide landscape shot is really interesting with lots of cool elements in it, clouds, flowers, whatever it is. Um, wide angle with a community, you're in the middle of a group of people with a wide angle lens and you can kind of see everybody there. That's a perspective people don't normally get because we kind of have a very narrow vision, but if you could pull out with a wide angle lens, it gives you a new perspective. You know, close up with a macro lens, you know, getting really details of things that your eyes don't normally get to see, like an insect or a flower or a post-it note on a whiteboard, whatever it is. Getting close, uh, but also getting below. Sometimes, you know, you don't get below animals like, you know, fish or something like that. Sometimes you're used to viewing them from above. So if you can get below something, then that creates another unique perspective that makes it very visually appealing. 
Another thing is to choose a focal point. So when you're looking at an image, the human eye naturally wants to find a focal point to land on. You know, there's a whole genre of art out there that's chaotic and it like causes your eyes to just wander around the piece constantly. Um, that could be unsettling. And if that's what you want, if you want to create that sense of being unsettled, you are more than welcome to use that in your photography. But generally what's most pleasing and satisfying for someone is to have a focal point, to have that anchor on the image so that their eyes can settle on it, look at it, and then move on. And then contrasting color. Um, there's something called a histogram, which shows your high light and your dark shadows. Um, not all cameras have this, which is totally fine, but if you have that option on your camera, you can open up that, that graph and see where your, your lines are. You want your lights to peak at the top and your darks to peak at the bottom and everything to be even in between, and that's going to give you the most satisfying uh, view on an image. So here's an image I chose of a shark. Um, I chose it because it's obviously got a focal point. Everything kind of leads your eyes to the shark. You're at the shark's level, which typically people are viewing sharks from below or above, but this is like you're swimming at the shark. And also it's kind of got an interesting background that kind of leads you to um, the shark. And there's other elements of this that I'll get to in the next slide, like the rule of thirds. This is another big one. For whatever reason, humans just have a satisfaction with the rule of thirds. Like <laughs> if it's not the rule of thirds or if it's kind of violated, it makes you feel uneasy. And again, if you want that feeling, you're more than welcome to utilize it in your photography. But generally the rule of thirds is good. So with this image here, this is a, a sphinx or a lynx spy, spider um, on a pitcher plant. And so it's really cool that these spiders kind of just like hang above the pitcher plant and they poach insects that are going in from the for the, the smell and the liquid that's in the pitcher plant. But on this side, it's the third, this is the third, this is the upper third here. So this spider fits up and up on the top third of the image. And then most of the color here fits on the right side of the image. So that's just something that people really like to see. And then creating depth is another thing. So you can see like this animal kind of is set out against the depth. Um, a simple background to highlight your subject or the thing that you're trying to show off in the image is really a good way of kind of like making it stand out. Um, if you want your subject to kind of like blend in with the background, that's another technique that you could do to show the environment around it. So like this is a certain depth where this image is the animal in it is like really standing out against the background, whereas this one you know, the background kind of leads you to the animal um, in the middle of the, the image there. Um, so when you're trying to create depth, what you want to do is you want to use your f-stop, which is on your camera. Again, you could YouTube a video to like figure out what the f-stop is and everything and how to like change your depth of field to make it look like this. Uh, but your cell phones also have a portrait mode which blurs out the background to bring your subject into the foreground so that it can stand out against the noise of the background or something like that. One of the another really big thing outside of perspective is using light creatively. So most images that you see or a majority of images are front lit. That's because the photographer has a flash or they're using the sun to try to get rid of the shadow. But honestly, get creative. You know, use the light to make your image look weird or different or add emotion to it. So like you could play with backlight, you could do side lighting. I think front lighting is overrated. So this image here is of an alligator and the sun is setting behind it. And what's nice about it is that the sun is highlighting the edges of its face, it's highlighting the grass that's in front of it, and it's highlighting the spider webs that are literally on its nose because it's been sitting there so long basking in the sun. And so those are all things that you wouldn't normally get to see if you were just to shoot, the, uh, shoot a photo of the animal from a normal, you know, with the sun or the light facing it. I mean, you might get some different detail on the image, but generally, you know, getting the side light or the backlight makes it look a little bit more different because it's a different perspective than what people are seeing and that's what catches the eye. 
Another nice thing to remember when you're using light creatively is to use golden hour. So that's the morning and the evenings where you have like an orange yellowish tint to your images. And that kind of is a really beautiful um, way of making your image stand out. Everyone likes yellows and oranges and stuff in photography. And so when you have an image that reflects that, it looks really nice. So like the shark image has that with the sunset there. Um, and this has it here. Sometimes you don't get to use light creatively because there is no light. It's just on a cloudy day. But, you know, the light's coming through the plant, the leaf here on the pitcher plant. And so it's lighting up the spider, which is pretty interesting. So really photography is all about light. So if you're trying to come up with an image and you want to do something creative, you know, take your subject. If it's a person filling out a report, put them in front of the sun or put them in front of a light bulb or get the reflection of light bouncing off their notebook or something, you know, get creative with the light because that's really what's gonna make your image stand out. Get creative with the perspective, the angles, the colors, all of that kind of stuff. So before we move on to submission details, does anybody have any quick questions about the storytelling or any specific to photography? Justin, that was... Um, super helpful. This is Caroline. Uh, I I love some of those tips and I, I took a little screenshots, even though I know this is going to be recorded. I did have um, a question. I These are really great tips, but I'm wondering if you have some basic tips for, or if you're using a cell phone, <laughs> um, you don't have access to a really high-end camera or even a mid mid-end camera. Do you have any basic tips for, for those types of people, which I imagine as many of us? Yeah, so the tips that I just gave are definitely for using any device that can capture an image. So if you have a high-end camera, you can use all this. But if you have a cell phone, you could still, even a wind-up camera or disposable camera, you could still use all of these um, tips for getting the, uh, a good photo. With cell phones in particular, um, really, the best thing you could do is play with light. And so, you know, cell phones don't do that great with low light, but if you have light and you're using it creatively, you can unlock a lot out of your cell phone. And, you know, depending on your cell phone, some will have a lot of different camera options. Like my cell phone has three cameras on it, which is kind of ridiculous. So some Phones like that that were made within the last three years, I would say they generally allow you to do macro, wide angle, and portrait and normal shots. Um, but even if you only have one setting and it's to take a photo on your camera and you have one camera, you know, you can get down on the ground, lay on your belly to take photos. You can stand up high to take photos. You can play with angles and tilt your camera a little bit and, you know, really play with the light because when you get good lighting on your photos, a cell phone camera is going to take a very good image. Mm -hmm. And one of the big things to remember is that we're not necessarily judging for the technology being used to capture the image. It's how the image was captured. And so even if it's not like the highest of resolutions, but we can gauge the the intense or the artistic creativity that went behind the image, that's still gonna score very high for us. So having good equipment is not a necessity for this photo story. I hope that answered the question. That, yeah, that did. I'm um, Maybe if like one thing I found, I just recently bought an iPhone. Um, and Becky, I know you have your hand up, so I'll, I'll be quick. Um, and I, discovered the portrait mode and which, you know, I didn't have that option in, in previous phones and, or cameras even, or I didn't know how to access it. But um, do you, do you think that's a good option for people so that you can kind of get focus in on your subject and create more of a blurry background? Yeah, if you have that option on your phone, that's definitely a good option to use because it does create that depth. I did mention earlier that your f-stop can be used to create or manipulate your depth of field, but portrait mode is a good method to do that as well. As well as macro mode, some phones have that as well, where you can like 
pick the flower. Sometimes they'll have like an image of a mountain, a flower, a person. You could choose one of those um, and bring your camera in close. When it's on the flower, it should also kind of create that sense of depth where the background is going to blur out and you're going to be focused on your subject. Another thing you could do to help increase the subject standing out in an image is to physically move them away from that background so the background is pretty far away. And then you can use um, the things on your phone. It's hard to make specific recommendations because there's so many phones out there with so many different settings. And I don't know if you know certain manufacturers have the phone options like portrait mode or macro mode or stuff. So if you have any questions about the specifics about your phones, mm -hmm. um, you can go online and you can definitely look it up and see what options are available to you and how to best unlock your photo phone capability, uh, your phone photo capability. Uh, but really any phone that's been made within the last several years is, is going to have the features that will allow you to take really interesting photos and have really unique perspectives with it. So yeah, definitely, you know, portrait mode works uh, with people, wildlife, flowers, whatever. Landscape mode works when you're trying to take a wide image. Uh, macro works as well. Um, and even if you have like a simple point and shoot camera, you can use those modes. Generally, those are built into the little wheel on the right side of your camera so that the, kind of the settings are kind of automatically optimized for you to take those kind of images based on your situation. Um, and if you need to use auto on your camera, that's totally fine. Um, but just remember, you know, perspective, angles, lights, that kind of stuff is really what we're going to be looking at. Great. Thank you. So Becky has her hand up. Yeah, um, I had a question, Justin, about um, the subject like how do you get a good photo of a subject that is moving around a lot? Uh, because that's my problem quite frequently <laughs> and it's always blurry. I'm not, I have very little photography skills, um, but if you could speak to that a bit, that'd be great. So I can give you two answers. From a technical standpoint, having a high shutter speed will allow you to take an image. So if you're using a camera, you can adjust the shutter speed. So it's like one over a high number. So like one over 800 is a decent uh, shutter speed for getting something that's moving around quickly. Um, and on your phone, you know, it really is dependent upon light. The more light that you have, the higher the shutter speed you're able to use. Um, you can use your ISO to increase your shutter speed if you can, but that's gonna kind of create a grainy image. But also a suggestion would be why not have it be blurry because it kind of shows the story of the thing that you're taking a photo of. It moves around a lot. It's crazy. You know, it could be crepuscular. Um, and so it's always dark anyway. And maybe the image just shows the story more that it's a blurry little thing that's running around in the forest because that could be its strategy for survival or, you know, whatever it is. So that you could use you're the challenge of taking a clear photo and just integrate that into the story that you're trying to convey if you're limited on the technology that you're using. Or use lots of shutter or use lots of ISO and crank up the shutter speed to get as much as you can. Another option is to use a tripod because it'll eliminate your, your hand movement with the camera or anything. If you mount the thing on a tripod, it's going to give you more stability. So the only thing that's going to be moving in that image is going to be the subject. Thanks. Cool. I can move on to some submission details unless there's one more question. Sorry, Justin. I, I wrote something in the chat um, and I was asked if I can mention it. I'm Christina. Um, um, I. I got some tiny clip on lenses that you can clip on to a phone and they do fun things like, you know, you can add a macro or a fish eye effect and, and they're not too expensive and they can do fun creative things. So that could be another idea. Yeah, that is 100% a good idea. And I have used one before where it's pretty nice. Uh, just like you said, it's like a microscope clip on, clip on that I used. Mm -hmm. It was pretty affordable. 
and I got a really weird image. I was like taking pictures <laughs> of like um, printer text on a piece of paper and it was cool to see how inconsistent it was. So yeah, those are definitely a great thing that you could use for your phone to get weird perspectives and things like that. And um, I have a question for you. I've read and actually in some like fundraising trainings, we've been told that some things that evoke emotion in people for specific purposes are, you know, close up of hands or, you know, when we use humans as an image. So hands or a face and even in animals, you know, just the big eyes and fluffy nose or, you know, there are some things that just evoke that sense of you know, being cute or having us want to participate in something is is there you know are there specific tips you want to give us on if we want to convey something about people in our story yeah if you want to convey something specific about people um you know really depending on the emotion that you're trying to convey and like how close you want to feel. So like, if you're going to be really close up to a person, I mean, that's a really intimate sort of moment there with the photo. And so that's going to make that person feel very close to the action or what's going on that way. Um, with wildlife, it's like really focusing on the eyes and it, the same with people. Like if, if you've got a person in an environment and they're doing something, you know, really make sure that the focus is on the eyes because that's what you're gonna connect with when someone's looking at an image of a person or an animal or whatever. The first thing that they're gonna do is look at the eye because that's just a natural focal point, but it's also kind of our social society kind of thing. That's what we're used to looking at um, in a photo. So if you're trying to make that emotional connection with your subject, focus on the eye and get close. Um, if you're trying to really show scale or looking at something from an outside perspective, then get far away from your subject and don't focus on the eye. Focus on something like an action or a thing that's happening because um, that's going to give, that's going to divert that person's gaze on the photo to something different to make them feel a little bit farther away from what's going on. Um, hands are a good one. Another thing, like I know within the theory of change, stuff you know posted notes on a whiteboard are really popular so you know getting the hand with the pencil writing on it or like getting that close up is also a good intimate way of showing like the work that's being done but i would suggest you know always kind of working in a face or something in the background to where you can also have that human connection so if your focus is on the hand and the writing and that's representing like an idea you could still have like a person or something with eyes that's out of focus and it'll still achieve the goal that you're trying to set with the photo. But again, it's, you know, a lot of these things, there's not really hard rules around. It's like the pirate's code. They're more of like a set of guidelines. So, you know, if you have an idea or a perspective or something that you think evokes an emotion that, you know, you haven't read or you haven't heard of yet, then give it a try, you know, it's kind of all about experimentation. But yeah, the biggest thing for building that emotional connection is eyes, eyeballs. Thank you. Cool, okay, I'm gonna move on to submission details now. So these are just kind of the details of submitting your photo story and making sure everything is, you know, organized in the way it best can be for us to go through it. So again, the guideline for submission, I mentioned it earlier, but it's now finally here in writing. Five to 10 photos is recommended. Um, I think that's generally, we're not gonna accept any more than 10. Um, five to 10, I think if you have a single story and you're telling it efficiently, you can stay under 10 photos. Captions are gonna be included with each of the photos and you can do two to five sentences um, per caption. So that gives, that's about a paragraph and that gives you the ability to, you know, kind of establish your background or establish your character or explain your character and then bring that character through the rest of your story by you know creating those bridges between your scenes so that's a little bit easier to understand 
you know, you can tell photo stories without captions, but generally I would say most photo stories do include captions. So you are more than welcome to go through there and add, you know, five sentences per caption per photo to help bring us through the story. Another important thing is to remember to name your photos specifically. Um, that will help us make sure that it's in order because sometimes, you know, technology does what technology does best and makes things very difficult. Um, and so it might reorganize the photos, but having them in numbered with your, your name of the photo and your organization will help us make sure that everything's laid out appropriately and how you want to see it in the final form. Uh, a little bit about judging. I touched on this earlier, but I'll say it again. You know, we're not necessarily looking at high quality, expensive photos. You know, we're really looking for creativity. We're looking for perspective. We're looking for art. Um, and that's really what's going to help tell your story because, you know, stories really are about the story. Uh, the way you deliver them can vary, but if it's a strong story and it clearly illustrates the use of the conservation standards, then that will be judged well. You know, if you have bad photos, good story, clearly use the, the illustrate the conservation standards, and that's being judged against a photo story that doesn't really you clearly identify or clearly illustrate the use of the standards and has kind of a weird story or a weak story has really good photos. The one with the strong story is probably going to judge better in this competition. And so special considerations uh, for your submissions, a project that's gone full cycle will also um, do pretty well in judging something that you can show, you know, from the very start of the circle to the very end that shows a complete story arc, a full cycle of the standards, that'll do really well. Um, and a project that incorporates human well being or climate change is a topic that we're particularly interested in showcasing for this, just because that's a really important one. Um, and then focusing on a specific story, you know, again, not falling into the trap of telling all of your stories and all of the ways that the conservation standards have been used in your, your programs, but like focusing on one specific program example that shows the full story arc, the full cycle will do really well in the competition. So important dates, the last day for photo submissions are July 15th. I'll say again, the photos don't have to be taken between now and July 15th, they could be taken in the past. Um, a question that had come up previously is, can you use images from other photographers? The answer is it depends. It depends on the agreement that each organization has with that photographer. If that photographer allows you to use that image for commercial purposes or competitions or whatever, then go ahead and use it. Um, but if you're looking at submitting an image that a photographer had donated in the past or um, that you had been using in the past, but it has to be watermarked, I would just reach out to that photographer, revisit the agreement or contract that you have with that photographer to determine whether or not it's appropriate to submit their images as a part of your photo story. Generally, it should be okay, um, but just make sure that you check in with them first or check the agreement or just make sure that you can use it. Um, judge, judging is to be done in August. In September with the winners being announced, hopefully at the CCNet rally in mid-October. Hey, Justin, could I um, ask one question or maybe make one comment? Yes. I think uh, your point was really good about uh, the uh, using other people's photos. And maybe one, well, I think you should always have their permission to use it for these purposes, but Maybe uh, another option too is to not take a, like say you win, not take the prize if that's gonna be violating the agreement. Um, Cause I, I hope that people will do this just because they wanna share their stories with the conservation standards community. So um, that might be one way around it. Just a, just a thought to share. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. So yeah, I mean, it's just 
sometimes photography can get a little confusing <laughs> with rights and usage and stuff like that. So just when you're submitting, make sure you're good to go. So the awards are really cool. And if you get first place, you get to choose two prizes. And then second and third place get to choose one prize from this list. And this list is published on the photo story announcement. So if you want to revisit this with the links, you can definitely do that. But just real quickly, one of the prizes is a testimonial video. That's what we've been putting out over the last two years of just kind of a short video that showcases your organization and use of the standards. Um, training for two individuals um, with the course, the Durrell's Wildlife Conservation Trust's course. Um, training for one individual for step three implementation, travel reimbursement for participation in the CCNet rally or a CMP retreat, or a one-year single project subscription to Marathi. So again, these links and everything are available on the announcement that we had put out, and so you can get more information there. But these are the prizes. They're pretty fun. <laughs> also, you get eternal glory <laughs> for being in <laughs> life. Exactly. People will always look at you and be like, wow, that is the organization that won 2022's photo competition with CMP. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we didn't say that. That makes me realize that at least we didn't say it here. But um, the big award is that you your story will be featured on the um, Conservation Standards website into eternity. <laughs> um, so, so that's what we're really trying to do here is we know there are so many great case studies out there, so many um, great stories to share. And so we're trying to come up with different ways to help that happen. And the prizes are a little bit of an incentive, but really um, the glory is in sharing your story with the community. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we're really excited to share the stories that come through. I mean, there's a lot of incredible work that's going on out there around the world and using a photo story to capture that work is like a really creative way um, to share that story with a lot of people to really gauge their interest and gauge that connection. So I'm really excited to start seeing a lot of the stories that come through to highlight all the incredible work that's being done around the world. And so with that, are there any last questions about submissions or even we can go back to stories or photo tips or anything, but if we have any last minute questions, I'm happy to answer them. Justin, I have a, a question about the third um, yes. rule. So I think that generally makes sense. Um, and, but I'm curious, like just even in this photo, like I'd say um, that that's more than a third. Um, so how, how do you determine the thirds? Is it just like having the subject off center or? Um... Yeah, so, but this photo, the actual photo, it's on the third, but I've compressed it to fit PowerPoint. Oh, okay. But there, so, Generally, you could just eyeball it. I mean, off center is best, you know, and you there's like a forgivable space on the screen here that is generally considered a third. So it doesn't have to be an absolute strict third of the image is where your subject is going to sit or whatever it is you want mm -hmm. the person to look at. On your phone and on your camera, you do have the option to put up grid lines. And those are just literally the, the thirds going across both ways where you can um, use those as a guide to kind of fit your subject where you want to on your image. If you really want to get that strict third, you can do that. And I did use that with this image. Um, this image actually represents um, thirds here and a half here. So you know, again, those are just general rules, but you can always break those rules. That's the whole point of photography is sort yeah. of breaking rules, except for, you know, 
dumping a camera that's not waterproof underwater, that's a rule that you don't want to break <laughs> um, in photography. But yeah, you could just eyeball it and see what the third looks like. Um, but you know, if you're kind of using these rules and guidelines in your brain while you're taking the image, you can kind of, you know, you'll generally come up with an image that's pleasing to you. And if it's an image that's satisfying and pleasing to you, then most likely it's going to work as an image in a photo story. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Well, if there are no more questions, um, that is fine. It, I will be available uh, during this competition to answer questions. I will just help you with technical questions and submission detail questions and things like that. And you can get my contact information from any of the CMP staff on this call or yeah. So, you know, we'd be available for you as a resource, but I'm not gonna give you too much information. <laughs> I'm not gonna give any feedback on any anything. I'll just give you technical answers or things like that. Um, so, yeah, I really appreciate you guys being on the call and your interest in this photography uh, competition. I think it's going to be really fun. I think it's a great way to showcase the work that's being done with the conservation standards to really change the way that these habitats and communities and wildlife are, are um, you know, thriving and surviving. So I appreciate all your guys' time and um, thanks again. This is great. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Um, really appreciate it. Yeah, and what a great idea. Thank you. And thanks for the webinar.